Governor Romney, I know you don't drink. I know Mormons don't drink. Although I understand news like this might drive you close to drink. What do you make of this? Well, it's obviously a very uh, politically oriented uh, uh, effort on the part of the president. He's uh, not been able to accomplish much, much so far in his second term, and he wants to show that he's doing something. I, I guess I'd like to know how many federal contractors are paid at the minimum wage. My guess is not a lot. Uh, the idea that federal workers are going to be paid even more than, uh, than people in the private sector, I, I'm sure that's going to make a lot of taxpayers unhappy. But, uh, you know, I, I think the president's kind of desperate to try and show some kind of progress on some part of his agenda, uh, even if in a, the case of something like this, it's probably pretty modest in terms of the number of people affected. But, you know, the real issue comes down to the minimum wage. This is something we ought to work together with him on. All right. So you would be open to raising it, but not to that level. Is that it? Well, my view, and I've expressed this some time ago, is that we're wise to take the minimum wage and link it to uh, the CPI inflator or some uh, inflator of, of uh, the, uh, the cost of money. And the reason I say that is because, look, every few years this comes up again. And the Democrats uh, parade around saying we should raise the minimum wage. And Republicans are looking at job creation and say, well, let's hold on a second. We don't want to kill jobs. But in the eyes of the American people, the Republicans always come off as being the ones that are not being kind to those that are working class citizens. And, and that's just the wrong thing. That's not why our party is, uh, is fighting on this issue. We're trying to create jobs. And in my view, we should take this issue off the table, link it to the, to the um, uh, CPI, and, uh, and take it off as a political issue. All right. So when there are polls out, and depending on the poll governor that say more than half of Americans favor increasing it, it really depends to the degree by which you increase it. Do you think that would include boosting it to the level the president has proposed, north of 10 bucks an hour? Well, that, that sounds like a pretty hefty number. And, and, of course, the fear is if you raise the minimum wage too much, I mean, let's pretend, for instance, we said, hey, why not $20 an hour? And people would, oh, that's, that's great. That's a celebration. Oh, everyone's going to make a lot of money. No, actually, what will happen is the prices of everything we buy will go up to account for the new cost of labor, and the net net effect will not be any positive uh, improvement for the lives of people who thought that things were going to change for them. So the right course is to keep the minimum wage in line with what's happening in inflation. And by the way, ha had we linked the minimum wage to inflation over the years, it would be just about where it is right now, a little bit, uh, probably a little bit lower, but just about where it is right now. It depends when you started the linking. You're quite right. But uh, of course. It's, separately, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas has said this kind of stuff is all really a deflection. I'm paraphrasing, Governor. But he really thinks it's incumbent on the president tonight to apologize to the nation uh, for the health care rollout and the debacle he says it's become. A, do you expect the president will do that? And B, do you think he should? Well, I don't think the president will apologize, uh, no. But I do think that for him to take the signature piece of his uh, entire presidency and to have so blown the, the uh, implementation of this that, that millions of American people uh, were, were not just inconvenienced but put in a very difficult position, this is a, an extraordinary breach of his responsibilities as president. And it's something for which uh, he obviously has to take a lot of blame. Uh, but even bigger than that, I, I know we, we focus on the implementation, and ultimately that's going to get fixed despite all of the pain it's caused people. The real problem, in my view, the real problem is that the president promised the American people time and again they can keep their insurance if they wanted it. They can keep their doctors if they want them. And that promise that he made about keeping your insurance, he has violated. He knew it at the time. It was dishonest. And that is something for which he should apologize profusely. So you think he did know it at the time, which means you think he lied? Well, there's, there's no question, but that in the, uh, I don't know when he began to know it, but there's no question that during the process of, of Obamacare's implementation and legislation was brought forward in Congress saying, look, let's make sure people can keep the insurance that they have. That was brought forward, and it was not something that the Democrats supported. The, the president and his staff understood that, that this was not going to be possible for people to keep the insurance they had. He knew that. It was dishonest on his part to, to promise one thing, knowing that, uh, that he couldn't uh, fulfill that promise. You know, uh, Jay Carney at the White House was saying, I believe yesterday, Governor, that whatever bumps the, the, the health care rollout is having are very similar to the bumps you had in, in Massachusetts when you were rolling out a state health care program. And that invariably this is the White House saying um, this is Romney care essentially on a larger scale, some bumps along the way, but they iron those out there. We'll iron these out here. What do you say? 
Well, again, there, there are two things, and the, uh, the uh, administration keeps on wanting to talk about the implementation and the so-called bumps, but these bumps are real people, real people whose, whose lives have been seriously affected. So th will those bumps be ironed out at some point? Sure, the implementation bumps and the software and so forth. By the way, we instituted our plan in Massachusetts piece by piece. We rolled it out group by group so we didn't have the kind of mess that's been created in Washington and around the entire country. They could have learned from that experience. But there's a second problem that the White House doesn't want to talk about and that we should talk about day in and day out because it affects the American people. And that is the promise that you could keep your insurance if you wanted it. And you can keep your doctor if you want your doctor. People are learning those things are not true. And that's not going to go away. The penalty of Obamacare is going to continue, not just in the implementation, but once it's implemented, the American people are going to see premiums go up. Many are going to lose their insurance policies that they wanted to keep, and a lot are going to lose their doctors as well. Th this is a, a, an extraordinary breach of the promise the president made. Then what do Republicans have to do, Governor? Because I was talking to Tom DeLay, the former House Majority Leader, who was saying we shouldn't help him in any way fix this and just let him sort of, you know, uh, get stuck on his open heart here and, and he'd have to deal with the fallout from this, that he doesn't think Republicans have to fix this, just let it die. What do you think of that? Well, I think we as Republicans do everything in our power to help the American people. Uh, I, I don't believe, however, that the president is going to let us fix uh, what, what kind of a mess he's made. Uh, so w whether, whether or not that could occur, I think it may be moot because uh, my own view is the right course is for Obamacare to be repealed and to be replaced. And there are a number of, uh, of Republican senators who just this week came out with a plan of replacing Obamacare with, I think, a, a program which, on the face of it, uh, has many of the advantages that people looked for in health care reform, but not the disadvantage of the employer mandate and higher taxes and, and the individual mandate. So let, let's look at, at improvements that let people actually do what the president promised they could do, which was to keep their doctor and keep their insurance. One of the things we're told, Governor, is that the president is going to do a little bragging about, even though a lot of folks aren't feeling it, the economy is doing much better than it was some five years ago. And uh, that unemployment is down, banks are off, off the mat, and uh, things are, are, are going a lot better than they were, and he should at least get some of the credit. Now, you, during the, the presidential contest, had credited the Federal Reserve for, for flooding uh, the system with money. Uh, sort of providing the, the wind at the back for the markets, maybe for the economy. It is Ben Bernanke's last meeting as Fed chair today. Do you think that easy money, or whatever you want to call it, got even easier last fall and that Ben Bernanke helped make you a loser? Well, um, I, I don't know whether the timing of, uh, of the monetary stimulus affected the, uh, the campaign. I'll let the economists and political scientists look at that. But, well, it was clearly you know, I, helping I the market. It. it was clearly helping the markets. It was providing easy money to the markets. Well, there's no question but that the, the uh, uh, quantita quantitative easing, so to speak, the flooding the, the market with money, uh, has contributed to an extraordinary rise of the stock market. Did it contribute way, to your it, defeat? Do you think that, that providing well, that easy money, and you were a vocal critic I, of Bernanke's, <laughs> that you might have provided easy fodder for him to actually put the pedal to the metal? I, I, I'm not going to look back to the campaign and, and what could have uh, contributed to my loss. I made enough mistakes that I'm sure that contributed most, uh, most heavily. But I, but I can say that one thing that I know the president and the Democratic Party are going to talk about a lot is income inequality. And in terms of a contributor to income inequality, over the last five years, income inequality has gotten worse, not better. And the biggest contributor I can think of to that income inequality that the president's concerned about is the policy of quantitative easing which held on interest rates, caused the stock market to rise. People who have a lot of stocks made a lot of money. Income right. inequality was therefore, therefore increased. And seniors and people on fixed incomes who had savings saw their returns and, and the interest on their, their savings go down dramatically. Seniors paid the cost of this. So the, the president's policies are what have contributed to the rise in income inequality. And for him to now grab this as a campaign slogan uh, is, is the, the height of irony. And I think the American people are going to recognize his record on this is not a good one. Uh, Janet Yellen is going to be a successor. And uh, the argument goes that if you like Ben Bernanke doing this, you'll love Janet Yellen because she'll do more of this. What do you think of her? What do you think of that? 
Well, we'll get a chance to see what her uh, uh, inclination will be. Uh, clearly, she has to recognize, as do the other uh, members of the Federal Reserve, that, uh, that the impact of quantitative easing uh, is not at all what they had hoped it might be. We have seen, uh, you, you indicated at the beginning uh, that, that the president will tout the fact that we're better off five years later than we were when he took office. It's been five years, Neil, five years. Uh, th this has been a, a terribly slow recovery, in part because of the president's policies, large measure because of his policies. And the idea of quantitative easing to uh, continue to try and boost the stock market, making wealthy people, people wealthier, uh, th that's not going to get this economy going. We have to focus on what it takes to get poor people out of poverty and help middle-income people get better jobs. Middle-income Americans are really struggling right now, and um, driving the stock market up higher and higher is not, not the answer to their challenges. Um, given the bumpy ride of the market of late, a lot of folks say you were maybe ahead of your time or maybe ahead of the curve. Uh, separate numbers and polls that are conducted a year after the fact. Governors say if the election were held over, you would win. Um, and then there's this documentary, Mitt, that's out that uh, shows you in a much more favorable, I think much more human light. I liked it particularly when, when your wife, Ann, messed your hair up. Um, but <laughs> that documentary surprised a lot of folks who apparently didn't know you that well, that you were much more human and, and, and much more real. Uh, do you regret something like that didn't come out while you were running? Well, I, I do know that if a film like that came out while I was running, uh, it would have been attacked from the left, parodied from, from all the, the, the comics. Uh, it would not have gotten the kind of viewing that, uh, that it obviously will get now. And, and frankly, most people don't have time to sit down and watch a one and a half hour film. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think the film is critical to my political success or failure in the past. But I, but I can tell you, I, I think it would make a, a lot of sense if people were able to spend more time getting to know the candidates, if we spent more time at the conventions broadcasting a good deal about their background, and if uh, reporters dug into their personal history and who they interacted with, those things I think would create a more full picture of the candidates. But frankly, the biggest problem in my campaign was, was me and my campaign. We, we made enough mistakes. Uh, that we take responsibility. I take responsibility for those mistakes, and I wish we could go back and, and make it all better, but you know, uh, time moves on, and, and we have to as well. All right, well, I watched that documentary. I really enjoyed it, because I, I, I thought I knew you pretty well, but then I learned, as a, my wife was impressed, how fastidious you were, and say, you'll see how he cleans up after himself. There were a couple of portions <laughs> of the documentary where you're, where you're, you're ironing uh, your cuffs, and then you're picking garbage off a floor, separately you're picking garbage <laughs> off a balcony, and I'm thinking, you're steps away from maybe becoming the most powerful human being on earth and you're you're picking up garbage are are you like a, a real neat freak what's the deal there <laughs> Uh, my wife would be surprised to have anyone characterize me as a neat freak, but but I, I did hear some people at Sundance when the documentary was being uh, presented there. They uh, they asked questions of the director afterwards, and they said to him, you know, wh why the pictures of Mitt Romney picking up paper and turning off lights? And he said, I could have made a 90-minute movie with Mitt only picking up paper and turning off lights. So, <laughs> so I, I'm going I'm to have to expand my life somehow. This right. is not a good, you know, a good thing, image. Another thing, Governor, though, I notice in, in I don't want to give the documentary out to those who haven't seen it, but uh, in other kind of behind-the-scenes campaign flicks, there's a lot of cursing going on, and on both sides. Uh, none in this. I mean, the, the, the sharpest players from one of your sons uh, uh, describing a disparaging comment John Kerry had made about you. Um, but very little cursing. You frown on it, clearly. Uh, they, they honor it, clearly. Um, is that just in the DNA? The family has to honor that code? Well, you know, we were all brought up in, uh, in, in, the, in a Latter-day Saint home. And uh, my wife and I, my wife joined our church later. My sons, of course, grew up in our home. Uh, you know, we just don't swear. Uh, just not part of our uh, of our experience. Uh, I, I can tell you that there have been a couple of times in my life, maybe more than that, in a work setting uh, when I might have let out with a, uh, a swear word, but that's, uh, that's the exception, and certainly not at home. But you did so, call uh, yourself uh, you did it as if to parody the press, a flippin' Mormon. It must have bothered you yeah, that, that label stuck to you. Well, you know, that was at the end of the first campaign, and, right. I, and I think that the, the McCain campaign had done an effective job in characterizing me as a flip-flopper, and uh, they didn't put the Mormon tag on. That's actually who I am. But, but in the minds of some primary voters, that was not a good combination. 
And, uh, and I was concerned that at the end of the first campaign, that was what I was known for, flip-flopping and, and being a Mormon. And uh, I'm proud of being a Mormon, but I'm not proud of that flip-flopping label. And that's something that obviously uh, I, I think was dispelled over time as people recognized, particularly the second campaign, nothing changed in terms of my positions from the first or second campaign. And by the way, nothing changed from the primary to the general as well. I was consistent throughout. That's uh, that, obviously... If you make a mistake, you've got to recognize that. But, right. but I'm a person of consistency and constancy. Um, you've also spoken very uh, favorably, and still do, of Chris Christie, the New Jersey governor, and this whole bridge scandal. Um, and uh, I was thinking that, that, that you said that none of that rings true to you. But we, we're, we learned that during the, the presidential race, uh, either the governor directly or his staff indirectly wasn't letting you hold fundraisers in New Jersey on his orders um, until either he decided who he was going to back or, or quite some time later and that you personally were shocked by that and shaking your head. Is that true? Uh, well, Chris wanted to make sure that, that uh, if we were going to come into his state and raise money uh, that he had something to say about it and who we'd raise money why, from why and so forth. Why should that matter? Why should that matter? Well, uh, I, my guess is Chris wanted to have the kind of uh, uh, political uh, leadership in his state that, that made sure he uh, he had clout in, in deciding who our nominee might be. And, I don't know. And to make me, sure Governor, that people... doesn't that sound bully-esque to you? Uh, no, no. I, you know, I, I consider it being kind of a strong LBJ type leadership style. All right. And I think people look at Chris Christie. I know some in the media are, are concerned that he's, he's going to look like he's too tough. But I think people want someone tough. I want I think they want someone who can get Republicans and Democrats to work together, who can control his own party and keep them from running off the rails. But doesn't that uh, so feed I, I a narrative, think... though, Governor, that, and the rap that has it, even if the governor wasn't directly responsible for what happened, at the George Washington Bridge, that he 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 had he condoned an atmosphere that would have made that possible. Well, it's one thing to condone an atmosphere of strength and determination and uh, and strong leadership. It's another thing to condone an atmosphere of, of if you will, dirty tricks and and payback and revenge. Yeah. And uh, you don't it, think it, he's I that. don't think. I don't think Chris is known for that. I don't think he will be known for that. I think he'd be known as a strong leader. But but look, we got some terrific people, in my view that are lining up to potentially look at 2016. I mean, you know Paul Ryan will always be uh, uh, first and foremost in my mind, given an extraordinary campaign that we worked on together and his leadership in Washington. But Jeb Bush may get in. Mike Huckabee might come back. Scott Walker in, uh, in Wisconsin could run. John Kasich in, your, in Ohio. Paul Ryan is your guy if he were to run. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to choose uh, favorites. Um, I don't intend at this point to endorse anybody in the campaign until the primary is over. Uh, but I, you know, I, I start by mentioning Paul Ryan just because we're very close friends. Sure, and sure, you're so. running mate. But, but you didn't we, mention we Rand Paul sure. and you didn't mention Ted Cruz. Uh, well, you know, they represent different parts of the party. I'm right. going to give them a chance to express their views. Uh, but I think that we are going to be best if we can unify behind a, uh, a leader of the party who represents as broad a portion of the party as possible. Um, on that issue, uh, a lot has been talk about... Uh, leaders and, and how strongly you respond to events. And as you know, given the Sochi Olympics, a great deal of concern about our security and whether the president has been responding forcefully enough about very real threats that might be out there. Now, you, I think in an interview on NBC, Governor, had said that you would be fine sending your family to Sochi. You think it's, it's a very safe city and will be safe for the Olympics. Did, did, did that extend to going outside of Sochi? Or, or would you say within that strict you know, quarantine zone? Well, it, it's a dangerous neighborhood, as you know. Uh, and that being said, uh, and the threats there are probably greater than we've seen at any other Olympics prior to the Games. Uh, at the same time, the, the Russians have put together, uh, I think, an unprecedented level of security. Some 40,000 police and military. I mean, I mean, the total number of police in the state of Utah, where we had the Games in 2002, I believe is around 4,000. That's in the whole state. Well, so the IOC president 40. thinks that Sochi is every bit as safe as Salt Lake was in O2, for which you're responsible. You agree with that? Well, I, I, I don't know the degree of threat, and, and I haven't seen their specific security plans, but I can assure you that 
based upon what I've read, the intelligence work and the security personnel are far greater than any other games has had to put together, but the threat's greater as well. What do I feel? I feel that the venues themselves will be safe, but there are soft places, uh, restaurants, mm -hmm. being on the street, actually lining up to get into a venue. Th these are places where, where the security is also going to have to pay attention. Uh, because you don't want any kind of harm to come to anybody, not just okay. at the venues themselves, but in the surroundings. Governor, thank you very, very much. Please stop cleaning up after yourself. You're, you're giving my life some <laughs> time here. A little more for this. Thanks, Neil.